Good evening. I'm so glad you tuned in today, and I think you're going to enjoy the subject that I'm going to be sharing on and teaching on. I'm going to talk about what it just really means uh, to be a Christian lady, not just a Christian woman, but a Christian lady. And I say that in terms of we want to represent the Lord according to the Word of God and in the very best way we can. And a lot of this is going to deal with Christian marriage because we all know that Christian marriage is very much under attack. The traditional Christian marriage is um, getting to be less and less a part of our culture. And the statistics are just overwhelming. So today we're going to talk about things that maybe we can do about it. Now, I know I, I was reading a book uh, written in 2004 by Dr. Dobson, and many of you know him. He's a Christian psychologist. But anyway, he said he was wanting us to, uh, the thing we can do is vote for the marriage bill that's going around. I can't even think of the name of it now. I remember when it was big and everybody was supposed to call their congressman. But you know, it's way too late for that now. Now we're just, uh, it's like we've almost lost the battle. And uh, we don't know, but it looks like homosexual marriages could be legitimized. And he does give three things that uh, are his fears or his concerns that will happen if homosexual marriage is legitimized. And this, again, was in 2004. He says it'll destroy the traditional family. And so um, he's concerned about that. And the second was it'll lead to polygamy and all kinds of other type of groups of people that can be considered married. And you think, oh, that's so crazy, that could never happen. Well, look at all that's happened that we thought could never happen. And then, um, let's see. Oh, this I thought was interesting. It says, the third reason marriage between homosexuals will destroy traditional marriage is that this is the ultimate goal of activists, and they will not stop until they achieve it. The history of the gay and lesbian movement has been that its adherents quickly move the goal line as soon as the previous one has been breached, revealing even more shocking and outrageous objectives. Now, uh, you know, in the old days, we used to sing um, onward Christian soldiers going as to war. Well, there's always been a war and a spiritual war. But basically, um, the Bible said the Bible is truth. Um, and so we have to gauge what is right, what is wrong, what is true, what is not true, according to what the Word of God said. Now, I'm t speaking to a Christian audience. If you're not a Christian and you're listening to me, you can just say, sorry, Linda, speak, you know, speak to the hand. But in reality, we all base our beliefs on something. And uh, if we are Christian, then we base our beliefs on the Word of God. And so you may say, well, um, Linda, what makes you an authority, okay? Well, I am not an authority as far as, um, let, what do I want to say, uh, psychological things and all this and that, but I will tell you, I've been married over 50 years. I have six children and 24 grandchildren, and uh, they are all working and have good, solid families. We've had one divorce in our um, family, and that's been, most of them have been married 25 years now. So. And so, my, and also, I do have a degree in theology, so I have a, the ability to judge the Word of God. Uh, but my main concern is, I have a heart to see people have a good, successful life. And Jesus came that we might have life and have it abundantly. And John 10, 10 says, Satan comes to kill, steal, and destroy. So, bottom line, I'm on the side of God, and God loves you. He has a plan for you, and His ways are right. If I'm dogmatic, I'm sorry, but I'm not sorry. Somebody needs to be dogmatic. I read where Hitler, when he first took off on, before World War II, he just took over Czechoslovakia, Czechos, some words I can't say very well. You know what I mean. And other countries, people just sat back and did nothing. The good Lutherans sat there and did nothing until all of a sudden, Nazism had taken over and they lost their rights. Well, as the church and as the Christian world, we've been that way. And um, so now suddenly half the people in our country are living together and not married. And we think, what happened? How did this happen? And some of us have children that are on their third or fourth divorce. And it's like going when we were in high school and people break up with their boyfriend every six months. Only now they're married and divorced. 
the Bible says in that in the last days, it'll be as it was in the days of Noah. People will be marrying and giving in marriage. There's so many things that are happening that are a sign of prophetic uh, scriptures being fulfilled. We could very easily be living in the last days. Um, but anyway, I want to give you some practical things. I remember the other thing that I, Jerry and I have been in rescue mission work for about 35 years and we pastored for 10. So I have heard testimonies, I have heard stories of young women whose lives have been devastated by the enemy, by the devil. And so I also know that God's ways work. Sure, sin is, might be pleasant for a season, but in the end, your life will be destroyed. God loves you, he's put these guidelines in place because he wants you to succeed in life. He wants us to have a joyful and happy and pleasant and peaceful life. Okay, um, I think one other thing I want to share that just my sister called on this. I, do you ever just think I've heard it all and then you hear one more thing? Well, anyway, the Girl Scouts now are going to take in transgender boys. And they haven't yet, but they're going to. And they said now they take in, they do have an, a, 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 sexual, a sexual child. Well, if you don't know what a sexual child is, that means they may want to be a boy one day and a girl the next day. They don't know what they are. But anyway, what, what does common sense, what does this say to you? This says to me that the homosexual agenda has just gone crazy. And also that we have some parents that need to know Jesus, amen? Because, you know, it's like my sister said, she was a tomboy. You know, the, how many people, how many children I can't imagine any kid up to 10 years old even thinking that much whether they're a boy or a girl. They just live life, you know. Some parents are getting in there with some crazy stuff is all I got to say. Um, I know my husband, he often teaches about, well, he quotes David Wilkerson, met a man on the street when he was out street witnessing. They had a white rat on his shoulder with a gold chain. And David Wilkerson said, why on earth do you walk around with that rat on your shoulder? And he said, well, you don't see anybody else with a white rat, do you? Well, the idea is some people have to have attention no matter how. And I think some of these parents who are dealing perversely with their children's sexuality are just wanting their own attention with a white rat. Now, that's just my opinion. You can just throw pies and hit your own TV screen if you want to, but I'm telling you the truth. And okay, now before I get into these tips, Eight tips on how to be a godly woman, how to be a blessed woman, and a, a woman who uh, can feel good about themselves. I want to explain again that Jesus came to redeem us and to help us and to forgive us and give us new beginnings. So if I read these, and I've read them to Christian women, and maybe they're on their third divorce, and they just say, well, but, well, you know, when we do things wrong, and we all do things wrong, you don't say, well, but. You say, Lord, I'm sorry, and then you move on in newness of life, okay? And again, I'm telling you the truth, okay? Um, one of the first things, and you can imagine that I'm going to start out with this one, but one of the first things that a Christian woman should do who is really worthy of respect and lives to please the Lord is that they wait until marriage to get into a sexual relationship. I know today that, uh, see again, the Word of God doesn't change with the times. It stays the same no matter where and when you, you grow up or when you live. So God says that we are to remain pure until we're married. They don't live with their boyfriends, bringing children into an environment that is not stable or secure. Now I'm going to hit this hard because like I said, I've talked to many women who are in homeless shelters. You don't know how many girls have been sexually abused because of a live-in boyfriend, and probably little boys too. It's just a, a, just a fact that God's ordin ordination of marriage and is a safety net for our children. Amen? And these are statistics. Statistics show that a higher incident of sexual and verbal abuse and further loss to children in homes happen in homes that are not bound to marriage. But even this is the most important reason. It's not just all of that because many people live together and they get along and it's not horrible. But the statistics are still over here that tell us these sad uh, statistics. 
but it says husbands who are working for the comfort and safety of their wife and children find a greater, deeper, more lasting joy than men who are allowed to shirk the covenant commitment of marriage. Okay? So, um, and also, it's good to be reminded that men and women who stay sexually pure until marriage do not have to worry about transmittable diseases which are rampant in today's world. So anyway, Dr. Dobson, I remember reading this a long time ago, he said that marriage civilizes young men. Well, I don't know if that's uh, chapter and verse, but I do think God created men to provide for their women and, and uh, there's just a joy that comes from provide, that men have from providing for their home and for uh, being in a committed relationship. So I'm gonna hit a little bit else on that before I move on. I also studied, and this is from Secular Counseling, but they said one of the main reasons that couples break up is infidelity. And it says that in any given year of a modern relationship, statistics based on heterosexual couples, isn't it sad they even have to put that in there, that the number rises to, in, okay, in one year, 6% are unfaithful, but over a lifetime, 20, only 25% are um, not faithful. 25%, I think that's pretty horrible myself, but um, anyway, it just shows that infidelity is a very large reason for breaking up. So um, it's just important to make that, commit make that commitment to yourself and to your spouse. As far as the transmittable diseases, I did not even understand how horrible that was until I attended a workshop and you would be amazed at how much, uh, how many diseases are out there. Not just HIV, but just tremendous amount of diseases. So again, it pays to stay pure in your sexual relationship until you get married. Okay, a second thing, and I'm just gonna hit on this, uh, I'm glad I, it's too bad my cameraman's a man, but he just has to listen to this. <laughs> but the other thing that is just as bad as not being, as being faithful until, or staying pure until you're getting married, on the other side is once you are married, the Bible states very clearly that your body belongs to your husband and your husband's body belongs to you unless you separate for a while for, for prayer and fasting. So in other words, if you want to be, have a good Christian marriage, and maybe I should talk, not call this about being a Christian woman, more on having a good Christian marriage, is you do not uh, have a headache every other night or have this excuse or that excuse and play games with your relationship, your sexual relationship with your spouse. We want to, we want to honor another place in, in Peter. It says women should re reverence their husbands, even as uh, Elizabeth reverenced um, her husband Abraham. Now, the new translations took that out and put respect, but uh, do we need to reverence our husbands? Well, no, but we need to respect them. I don't want to jump all over the place, but uh, one of the other reasons common reasons for marriages breaking up is because women put their husbands down in front of other women. And it can be a habit and men, men can be just as bad. But again, the first thing we need that I want to stress is in our sexual conduct to be faithful to your husband, to be pure until you get married, and to be um, honor the union of your, your sexual union once you are married. And the second one, which is part of that, is ladies stay faithful in marriage. So it's just important to, um, and you can't legalize it. You just have to determine, this is the guy that is going to be my partner for life, or this is the woman that's going to be my partner for life. So let's be friends. Let's, let's enjoy each other. Let's build one another up. Let's watch each other's back. Amen? Okay. So um, one thing, I, I counseled a couple last week, and I won't even get into their background, but I could tell you it did with selling drugs, it did with the streets, you know, it was pretty much. And uh, they, but they wanted, to, they wanted to work this marriage out. And I'll tell you the clue that, that they're doing, gonna do okay. She said, I had one divorce and I determined I am not gonna get another divorce. And you know, it's this determination, I am not gonna get a divorce, that, that you can work it out. If you determine, I'm gonna work this out. But if you say, 
it's just all about me, you know, then it won't. Marriage is not 50-50, it's 100-100. You give 100, they give 100. And uh, if, um, but anyway, I'm, we can't cover everything on marriage in this. There's, there's always exceptions that need a little bit more, etc. But I'm talking about just two people that are living life and they've got a normal brain in their head that if you commit and um, determine that you want to be, have a happy marriage and a good marriage, you can do it. Amen. Um, so I think one of the first rules is don't use the D word. Don't say divorce. When you have a controversy or a disagreement, don't even think divorce. Think this is for life. This is my partner for life. Okay. And you say, well, you don't know. My mom and dad were divorced 10 times or five times. Hey, there has to be a time that you break that generational curse. I know lots of people, you don't even look at their background. You see them today as a functioning, happy, Christian, good witness to the, to the Lord as they live their life out for Him. Okay, third thing, um, and this again, is that if you really want to represent the Lord well as a Christian woman, uh, dress in a dignified manner. Don't walk around in ultra-revealing clothes. It doesn't matter what's on television or what the uh, latest fashion is. Dress modestly. And, you know, in the old days, women had to wear black. And I remember as a kid, this is so funny because my dad was not in church. But I remember my mother, who was a wonderful seamstress, making me this little red dress. I was probably about seven years old. And my dad said, you're going to, you know, you cannot wear that red dress. Mm -mm. Like that red dress was going to make me a harlot or something. And it's funny because he was, you know, he was not a churchy person. But see, way back then, the generation or two before me, uh, very much they w believed in wearing black and uh, very modest and any lipstick or anything was just taboo. Well, so you might say, well, Linda, you're just way back when. But there's a certain amount of modesty that always counts. And so just use your good common sense. You know, ladies, when you're starting to reveal things that don't need to be revealed. You know when you're starting to attract attention in the wrong ways. We know that men are uh, motivated through sight. And so when you do that, and, and then don't be complaining if some man makes a move on you and you feel like they didn't respect you as a Christian woman. Also, while we're here, I just want to mention also that the difference between men and women and the way they're made, um, men are attracted by sight and, uh, now I can't remember what I was going to say on that, but uh, let me think a minute. Anyway, we won't worry about that, but just, uh, just as a Christian woman, just be modest in your apparel. Amen. Enough said. Okay, the next thing that I want to talk about, and this is a problem today that I don't hear. We run a rescue mission. I never hear cursing in that rescue mission. One thing, we're Christian. We have our posters. We have, you know, 50, 60, 70 people come in for lunch. I don't hear any cursing, and these are people from the street. So guess what? There's a certain amount of self-control that anybody can practice if they love the Lord and honor the Lord. But the use of profanity uh, is really something that is part of uh, something that the enemies come in with to uh, degradate people. We're, God loves us. We represent Him. Satan hates us because we're creating God's image. So he'll do anything to make us look bad, act bad, dishonor our God. Even if we're not Christian, he'll do that. So anyway, uh, a Christian lady does not use coarse language. Uh, uh, Ephesians says, let no corrupt talk come out of your mouths, but only such as good for building up as fits the occasion, that it may give grace to those who hear. So um, I don't think I need to go into that a lot, but I think that if you are addicted to cursing, and I'll tell you, there's a lot of people who are addicted to it. I heard one person say, just take a little jar there, and every time you use the F word or the, 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 any other low-class word, just put a dollar in there, and you can break the habit. But I'll tell you something. You want to impress people, even people who don't know the Lord. 
can be embarrassed if their friends use really low-class language. And I call it low-class because it is. God created you for something better than that. I could do a whole teaching on the power of words and a lot of other Christian teachings, but um, I really feel like the Lord wants us to get down into everyday practical living so that we can represent Him and have standards that are according to the Word of God. Okay, do I need to say that don't, Christian women don't need to smoke or drink? Or that they need to, um, that certainly don't need to view pornography? And you know, mo many times Christians will say, they'll teach a whole seminar on pornography or this or that, you know. Personally, I don't think that we need to make a great big deal out of this. I think we need to just quit doing it, ask God to forgive us, and walk in newness of life. When we make too big of a deal out of these different sins, we're glorifying the sin as far as I'm concerned. When Jesus walked the earth and he preached the gospel and he said, I came to save sinners, not the righteous. He said, come and follow me. He, the woman who was a prostitute all of her life, come go and sin no more. It's not a big deal to quit sinning and begin to live for Jesus. You can do it in an instant. Just want to encourage you, find a good church. And when you get into that, go to a church, look, for, look at the people, don't just listen to the pastor, and then say, who do I see in here that maybe I'd like to be friends with? Find, uh, if you're married, find three or four young couples with kids your age, the same that you have common, and, and hang out with those people that talk about the Lord, but also talk about other things in life. But pick your friends. And of course, I want you in a Bible-believing, Bible-teaching church, but um, that's just the platform. And your, your life is a lifestyle, so you need others to share that lifestyle with you. So pick your friend, the Bible teaches, pick your friends carefully because you will be like those you hang out with. And there's a lot of neat young couples out there in the churches. There's a lot of good senior groups out there. And uh, I have many more things to talk about on this and there's no way I'm gonna cover it. But I do wanna share one thing before I close too. And that is, m may, well, two things I wanna share. One thing is most kids that are messed up there's a lot of things that could cause kids to be messed up. But one of the biggest that I've seen in my years of experience is when mom and dad don't get along, when they're not a united uh, front. So if you disagree with your husband on anything concerning those kids, don't talk about it in front of them. And the other thing is, don't put down your husband in front of your kids and don't put down your wife in front of your kids. If you speak words of life to one another, you will have healthy kids. You don't have to be the perfect parent in any way, shape, or form. All you have to do is show honor to their parent, to the other parent. Okay, and the, I feel like I'm talking a mile a minute today, but the other thing I wanna to say to people my age, I am amazed, or maybe 10, 15 years younger, whatever, empty nesters. I am amazed at the people who are living with somebody they don't like. And um, a lot of it is bad habits. I won't say don't like, because I know there has to be some love way down deep in there or you wouldn't be still married. But I just wanna encourage you, it's never too late, never too late to begin to have a happy home and a good loving marriage. It doesn't matter how long you've been married and how many bad habits are in that family. If you begin, to really show respect and love and uh, serve that other person that you're living with just in the little ways. You'll be amazed how much happier you will be because the Bible says it's more blessed to give than to receive. So it doesn't matter what they say or what they do, but words of kindness and acts of kindness will go a long way. I really believe that the woman most of the time sets the atmosphere in a home. So if you are the, you're listening and you are a woman, I would just encourage you to pray to the Lord Jesus, ask him to help you, and he will empower you to create a happy, healthy, pleasant home for you to live in as well as your husband and your whoever else comes in it. If you're single, do the same thing. Pray over that your home. Have people in who, um, are happy people or, or minister, those who come in, they, if they have problems, minister life to them and encourage them because um, God has called us as Christian women to, to be a blessing to those around us. And we can only do it as we stand true to the word of God. We cannot compromise with the world's culture. 
You can't say, well, I, you can't have your friend come in bad mouthing her husband and say, well, I agree with you all the way. Now, if he, not talking about abuse. That's a whole nother story and we can talk about it another time. I'm talking about just selfish disagreements. Always encourage that friend in her marriage, no matter how bad it is, encourage them because God loves families and he established marriage between a man and a woman. It's a covenant relationship with God. And if we'll commit it to him, it doesn't matter how bad it is, how much mess has been in the past, whether it's adultery or whatever. It's a new start with Jesus. So just get in there, commit yourself to him, ask him to help you because the biggest battle against the culture war, against Christian family or against traditional family is for us to be like Joshua. Say, as for me and my house, we'll serve the Lord. Amen.